Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm calling to order the Laporte County Commissioners meeting for Wednesday, April 17th. If you could all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Mrs. Matias? Present. Mr. Mrzinski? Present. Dr. Cora? Present. A quorum is present. Thank you. Next item is the agenda, consideration of the agenda. Motion to approve as presented. Uh, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, then consideration of approval of the minutes from March 20th meeting. Motion to approve as presented. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Consideration of claims. We have payroll ending 4-9-2019 in the amount of $1,222,376.49 and miscellaneous claims in the amount of $2,491,541.28. Motion to approve the claims as presented. Support. Thank you. Uh, Christy is sitting in for our auditor. Thank you for doing that. I just wanted to make one comment. The miscellaneous claims, uh, it's kind of high because we paid the the Franklin uh, Street Bridge uh, repairs through That's the reason why it is higher than the usual. And Dr. Core, I think it's important to note now and again that um, miscellaneous claims, regardless of the number, this is a money that has been approved yeah. for expenditures and it covers everything from paper products to um, contractual services that we have already um, gotten permission to spend. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate all of you reviewing the claims. I appreciate that. Um, public comment. Anybody from the public? would like to comment. So important to note that um, we now have public comment in two places at our meeting. We have public comment at the beginning of the meeting around general issues. If you have a public comment about a specific ordinance or resolution at the time that comes up on the agenda, you're welcome to speak at that time as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. My name is Stephen Grott. I live is at your mic on? Got a light on. Okay. Light on. Is that better? Yeah. My name is Stephen Grott. I live at 4304 North, 400 East Rolling Prairie, Indiana. I guess I have a question for Mr. Merzinski. At the last commissioner's meeting, you announced that we were going to, the veterans would be in a booth at the fairgrounds, but you also said there were two posts that already signed up, and quite a few of the fellows are wondering how them two posts knew anything about it when this was the first time it was brought up that we ever knew. Actually, there's five posts signed up. They were, the, the, the notices were sent out all at the same time. And as the notice said, it's first come, first serve. Okay, uh, just curious why. But, uh, thank you. May, may I say something? Yes, please. <clears throat> um, name. Uh, name, name, Martin, name and address, yes. Charles Martin, and with the American Legion, the, uh, I uh, I'm a member of the American Legion, the VFW, the uh, AMVETS, the Vietnam Vets, and to date I have not seen anything regarding having your uh, membership or your uh, request in prior to uh, yesterday or the day before. I wanted to ask. So how, 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 how are they sent out? They're sent out in U.S. mail, and and VVI already has a spot. So does Ambet. Yes, they do. But, they both have. But, a, they, but, both have but a they received them uh, after the other two people received them. I can't help the United States mail. I don't know what to tell you. Or oh, if they heard it at the meeting. I, I don't know. I, all I know is it's first come, first serve. There's five of the seven days are now taken. So there are two. Uh, there is uh, two, two, two other spots available. So there are two other spots available in case if anybody else is interested. Well, I understand, but what our question is, how did the other? The how did the two other got notified? Yeah, maybe we we can if you can look into the uh, yeah, the I just okay. Yeah. Take them as they call. We we'll look into that. Best, so, yeah. best we can do. It. Thank yeah. you very right. much. Thank you very much. Appreciate, yeah. appreciate it. So I think the issue for the veterans is is more complex than just when they receive the notice. And I, I guess, Mr. Mrzinski, this is what they're 
they're trying to talk about. And that's um, that, you know, there's preferred days at the LaPorte County Fair because more people are attending on certain days than other days. So that there's, that's why they are raising the fairness issue. And even greater than that is the issue that you and I have discussed uh, unsuccessfully, I might add, that um, the veterans have requested some veterans groups that don't have a post and don't have constant fundraisers, pancake breakfast, fish fries, etc. Um, they don't have a way to raise money and so they have um, several years, uh, they have come to the county fair. Um, I saw them in uniform. They were in World War II uniforms and, and um, uh, Vietnam era uniforms um, last summer when I was at the fair. Uh, they, they requested that they would be able to um, uh, look for donations and when um, they done it successfully on the midway in the past uh, inside the front gate or somewhere on the midway and for some of those posts this is their one way to raise money um, they are American patriots um, I frankly think that we're, we're you know not being um, open-minded about it uh, so that all veterans in regardless of whether you're in a very small post or organization or in a very large one that the people in LaPorte County are very generous people they have big hearts and if they know that veterans are trying to raise money to, for their for their work, uh, I'm sure that they would support it. So I think that's the underlying issue here, and I just wanted to make sure that we were very transparent about that. So, uh, well, if that's open for discussion, this was a decision made by the fair board, not me. <laughs> this was a fair. This was a decision made to make this uh, opportunity available to all veterans groups in the county, all 14, not just one or two. There was issues with them standing at the gate. Several issues. That's why the fair board addressed this and came up with something different. And I see veterans groups standing at Al Al's, at Kroger's, at Tractor Supply. I see them st and, and doing Porta Pit. I see that there's. There's a lot of opportunities out there if they want to get out and do it. So this isn't the only thing in the entire state of Indiana that they, they can do. So I, I beg to differ with that. If you could just take it to the fair board and see if we could be a little bit more inclusive. I think for, that for this be year, the, the yeah. first five who have applied have a date, and in fact, VVI, that's the date they wanted. They got the date they wanted. So um, there's two open, there's two left. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Public comment. Good evening. Um, I would like to, uh, at this time, thank the commissioners for passing a resolution against the uh, uh, NIPSCO increase and to take action on this rate increase. Uh, so tonight, I would like to, uh, excuse me, my name's Paul Prisbolinski, 1716 Washington Street, Michigan City, Indiana. I uh, wrote a letter to the editor and uh, I would like to read it in its entirety tonight, yeah, if well, that's okay. Um, I see that it's not too long, so yeah, please no, read it's it not in its too long. entirety. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, dear editor, here we go again. This sounds a, an awful lot like 2002 when NIPSCO suddenly decided to close five maintenance hubs in northwest Indiana. And both the steel workers, of which I am a member, and LaPorte County had to fight together. And we won that in front of the Indiana Supreme Court. And those maintenance hubs were, are still open to this day. Now NIPSCO, after other utilities moved to renewables a decade ago, make the abrupt decision last year that they're going to close their entire coal fleet and that we, the ratepayers, spent one billion cleaning up the scrubbers and they're going to shift suddenly to all wind and solar but they but they're not going to invest any of it here so let me get this straight we nipsco ratepayers pay the second highest rates in the state we uh excuse me we'll see the michigan city generating station closed losing a couple hundred good paying jobs and millions in tax revenue to the city of michigan city and to the county anybody who thinks that the city is going to be able to use the contaminated site on which this gen station sits for under a decade is dreaming. Take a look at the Nipsco Mitchell coal fire station. They took it offline in 2002 in Gary and they only demolished it 14 years later in 2016 and are still cleaning up the site. 
Why not look at tearing down the cooling tower and cold conveyor belts and convert the MC station to wind or solar rather than buying expensive purchase power from outside the grid? I understand NIPSCO was considering building a new natural gas fired gen station in Port County near a major gas pipeline and then abruptly dropped the plan. Thank you, LaPorte County Commissioners, for intervening in this rate case and asking these tough questions. We deserve answers. Paul Przbolinski, former Michigan City Councilman. I would like to enter that into the record. And, and Please uh, hand it to, to Diane. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thanks for your uh, comments, and we share we share those concerns, and that's the reason why we, as a commission, have decided to intervene. I would also like to take this time to support the Michigan City Common Council, who also initiated an initiative to have a resolution against, and then also other Northern Indiana communities took uh, heed and did the same thing. But I will say, as a personal, um, as myself, besides being involved with uh, politics, is that high gin rates, high electricity rates, is a direct deterrent to economic development. And this is something that in Laporte County, people need to get uh, in. Uh, well, we need to be activists, and I, I appreciate what we're, what you're doing, what you're trying to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your Thank comments. You. Any other public comments? Any other public comments? All right. We will move on to department head comments. Any department heads? <clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Kathy Kroback, LaPorte County Clerk. Um, I was before you a month ago, I guess, about um, voters registration. Um, I'm here to report that we did meet um, Monday this week. Um, Miss um, Miss Stevens, who this was pertaining to, was in the room. So was um, the Republican chair, Mr. Ficus, and the Democrat chair, Mr. Kimmel. Um, I went over with the board, which they had already, they already knew about the nine, or actually there were 13 different items that happened during last year's election that was either behind me or unbeknownst to me that ended up to be my responsibility. Um, we discussed that briefly, um, and then we talked a little bit about um, what I called the ghost employment that was going on in the office. Uh, Mr. Ficus did come to the podium. He addressed the issue. Uh, he said that um, he thought that, and I believe back in June of last year, where there was a meeting which some of us were at. I was there too, uh, trying to address this problem. Um, he said that in the meeting that open communication would be um, the best solution to this. Um, our board, the election board, felt the same way. Um, I thought that's kind of what I've been doing for the last year and a half, meeting with everyone and trying to discuss this, including both party chairmen. Um, it's my understanding that HR uh, kind of wrote off the first year of Heather Stevens's time with the county because I, I don't know if she thought she was getting comp time, which she's not entitled to, or what was going on. But HR did decide that we're going to write off the first year, which would take us from July of 17 to June of 18, basically. Um, kind of like drawing a line in the sand and let's start over. Uh, the board felt that too. So that's kind of where we started at. Um, I don't think it's right, but that's where we are. And um, I still went through and I used the, uh, I know Mr. Ficus wanted proof as to the time I used the file report. I still came up with from that date till this March, five days of sick and a half a vacation day that um, I didn't think was in, she was entitled to, which is after that June line in the sand, but I mean, that's where we're at. Um, I know that they are classified as exempt. I don't know that that's appropriate for that office, and exempt employees do not get comp time, and I think maybe that she thought she was taking comp time. 
but they don't aren't entitled to comp time. Um, it was stated that uh, by both party chairs, and I think the board also stated that they thought the way it's set up today, with um, the county chairman picking both co-directors, was the best way to do it. Um, again, there's nine counties out of 92 that do that. The old, the rest of the 83 counties in the state of Indiana do not operate that way. They operate under the clerk. Um, it was also stated at the meeting that they thought it ran really smooth in the past. That truly is not the case. Um, my predecessor has been before this commission more than, I know she was here twice with problems in that office and there was nothing that was done about it nor could she do anything about it. So I know that there's history there in that, in that office. Um, the election board did hesitate to make any changes as far as um, putting it under the clerk. It wasn't their recommendation at this time. Um, and that was never my intent. As you know, I do not want them. I just want to have someone supervise them. That's it. Um, so, uh, and the board did uh, recommend at the meeting, at the end of the meeting, not piling more responsibilities back on the clerk from activities and things that go on in that office that aren't right. And both board members said, this has got to stop. So, and which I have a support of. Um, at this time, since I don't know if you are in a position to appoint somebody to supervise them, but if you are not in that position at this time, I would tell you at this time that I um, plan to kind of be the unofficial supervisor of that office overseeing their work product. Not them but their work product, because evidently most of that does come back to me in the end. Right. So um, that being said, um, that's basically where we left it. Um, we did address also, at, um, we had a recess, and we addressed um, an issue that we're having with some absentee ballots applications, um, a potential voter fraud, we're not sure, and so we addressed that, and we did, there were uh, actually 11, and the address on the application was all to one person. And so we went ahead and we forwarded those application or the ballots out to those those uh, voters at the time. Um, and then we copied them and we're sending them to the state police. So I don't know if you have any questions. I appreciate you giving us an update uh, on the uh, election board meeting. And uh, so what we'll do is we will, um, as per the recommendations, they wanted HR to follow through on the uh, employ uh, the staff uh, situation. So we're going to follow up with uh, Barb Mossman regarding that. And we'll continue to explore uh, ways of how best to continue to have both the uh, party chairs appoint them, but have a better way of uh, supervision and uh, we will continue to work with you in making sure that happens and the, the and the office functions smoothly okay and I, I will tell you if there's an issue I will be here at the please, next meeting. please yeah no we, I, we appreciate that and oh. we'll continue to work with you to make sure that things go smoothly okay thank, thank you. you any other department heads <clears throat> Hi, I'm Heather Stevens. I am the co-director in voter registration. Um, I just want to take a second to just set the record straight. <laughs> Never did I think that I did not just decide that I was entitled to comp time. I was told that I accrued comp time by HR. When I took the comp time, that's when all the chaos started. So she then went back, looked through everything, and I have the emails, and said, wait, you're not non-exempt, you're exempt, you don't get comp time. So I was like, okay, now what do I do? So again, this was nothing underhanded, this was nothing, this was, I got bad information, then there was miscommunication because nobody was talking to me. And that needs that that shouldn't be. If there's a problem in my department, why why not talk to me? So I, I've been very frustrated. Commissioner Brzezinski did sit down with me at the fair and said, "Hey, what's going on?" And I told him, and he said, "Okay, we'll get it figured out." 
There have not been any issues since. I keep track of my time. I send it each week to myself, to the chairman, and to Barb Mossman, not because that's what, that's what I have to do, but that's to cover me. So this has been, it's been a horrible year. Awful. This has been constantly at me, and I would like very much for this to end today. Yeah, thanks for the clarification, and we'll work with HR. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other department heads? All right, seeing none, we'll, uh, I think we don't have any requests. Old business, uh, consider recommendations of class 11 uh, and 12 bids. Bob Young. So Mr. Young, I believe, is at a conference. Uh, so Shaw, do we have any updates on that? Uh, generally, the department simply reports back either the uh, superintendent or the assistant superintendent with a recommendation. So I know they took the bids under advisement, but I have not seen the That's report. Okay. Maybe well, Mr. We, we, we copies. Do, no, we do have written copies. Okay. Yeah, we have written copies. So I can speak to that, Mr. Yeah. President. Yeah. Go ahead. So on April 10th, the highway department uh, submitted their recommendation on the um, the yeah. bid class 11 and 12. Uh, there were two bids in class 11, and they are accepting low bid only. So the bid is awarded to Bitmap Products of Indiana, of Indiana. Class two is the hot asphalt concrete. There were two bidders, uh, Reith Riley Construction Company and Walsh and Kelly. We are accepting the low bid only, so the bid is awarded to Reith Riley Construction Company. Right. And I believe that is that um, I'll concludes the motion bids. to that effect. So moved. Second the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is consider ordinance to amend the zoning map petitioner Pitts family. <clears throat> Good evening, Dr. Cora, Commissioners, James A. Masters here for Pritz Family, LLC. Uh, I'm here to address any further questions that might come up concerning the rezoning for this property that is located just north of Paws Road. This rezoning will take the real estate from business B2 to multifamily uh, residential R2A for a townhouse residential district. At present, the real estate is zoned for big box retail and this rezoning will change the uh, zoning to residential. This will allow the construction of 33 two-unit townhouse buildings, 66 units in total. The townhouses will be more in keeping with the residential character of the development near Paws Road. <laughs> to give you some idea of the demand for this uh, type of townhouse uh, housing, Mr. Pritz has already received offers for four units before a shovel of dirt has been turned at the development. Now after the first reading of this rezoning bill a month ago, you received a letter from the town engineer for the town of Trail Creek raising issues concerning stormwater runoff from this project and expressing a concern for flooding on US Highway 20 and Trail Creek. I responded on behalf of Pritz Family LLC with a letter to you dated April 3. It's evident that the Tr Trail C Creek town engineer knows nothing about the drainage plans for this project and did not check the plans before sounding off with his letter to you and others about flooding issues. I, uh, I know that we gave you a site plan of the project, but I'd like to show you another one that might help you uh, identify the drainage for this project. And I'm sorry I didn't bring one for each of you, but hopefully you can see this. Maybe we can pass it on if we can take it, and then we can pass it on. I think we have some you probably have those. copies of these. Well, that just shows the evening. development itself. Okay. I'd like you to see the bigger picture, which shows all of the land that runs between Paws Road and US 20. And as I stated in my letter to you, what the Trail Creek Town Engineer mistakenly assumes is that the stormwater runoff from this project will flow north through an existing drain pipe under US 20 into Trail Creek. That drain pipe is located directly north of uh, Pine Tree uh, on the um, north side of US 20. What the Trail Creek Town Engineer apparently is not aware of is that Pritz Family LLC constructed a drainage ditch along the east side of its property that runs 
into an existing drainage ditch on the south side of US 20 at its own expense. So if you look at the site plan and follow the east side of the project, and you'll see where there's the blue yeah. it, that runs all the way down to, to US 20, and then moves goes to the east and ties into an existing drainage ditch, which then flows into a retention pond right there at Johnson Road in US 20. So this ditch is intended to divert stormwater runoff away from Trail Creek. Presently, with no development on this property, the uh, water runoff would flow uh, to the north, west, towards that pipe that goes under US 20 and then flows into Trail Creek. With the drainage ditch that's been constructed, that water will run due north and then go eastward into the existing drainage ditch into the retention pond and stay on the south side of US 20. It will not flow into Trail Creek. You know, I'm glad you addressed it because Commissioner Rosinski last at the last meeting was concerned about the Trail well, Creek drainage. Of the trail he, creek, yeah. We've had a dialogue for several years about this. He's been concerned about the water runoff, and I think that's probably in large part why this was done this way, is to divert the water away from Trail Creek okay. into that retention pond and keep it on the on uh, the south side of US 20 away from sure. the town of Trail Creek. So if if I don't know if you want to d discuss or debate this, but if there's a flooding problem at Evergreen uh, Plaza or at Trail Creek, it would seem to be that's the responsibility of, of Trail Creek's town engineer, and he designed the drainage systems for both Evergreen Plaza and the town of Trail Creek. The letter that I sent to you, I also sent to State Senator Bohasek and State Representative Patricia Boy, because if there's a flooding problem on US 20, uh, now would be a good time to address it while the state is planning to do uh, some widening and other development along US 20. <clears throat> what I am told is that <laughs> west of Woodward Avenue, there is a drainage ditch on the south side of US 20. But when the, the uh, stormwater runoff would get to Woodward Avenue, it's forced under US 20 onto the north side and into a ditch that then leads into Trail Creek. The solution would seem to be to extend that drainage ditch that's there on the south side of US 20 eastward from Woodward and tie it into the drainage ditch that's there that leads into that retention pond at Johnson Road. Now, that's what we suggested in the letter that was sent to our state representatives and perhaps this, this body could use its persuasion to perhaps help them, I guess, or, or encourage them to bring this to the attention of uh, INDOC to see if, uh, if that's what they can do to relieve the problem. But in terms of um, Pritt's family, LLC, it's already done its part by diverting the water from this project away from Trail Creek and keeping it on, on the south side of US 20. Uh, I, I said to you last time the economic benefits of this project. The land is farmland right now. It generates $935 a year in tax revenue. It's estimated that once 66 townhomes are built on it, tax revenue would be $118,000 per year. The construction uh, costs and the revenue generated from constructing this project is estimated to be $11 million. On behalf of the Pritz Family LLC, we ask you to approve this rezoning. If there's any questions, we will try to answer them. I want to add one question. Would this be considered like a middle class housing? Uh, well, is it uh, like two bedroom, three bedroom? Well, what, what kind of housing? Is it? I think two or three bedrooms, Wally. Three, three bedrooms bedroom. and two okay. baths. Two baths. And they're in the price range of 120 thousand. 180,000. Yeah. yeah, because there has been a need for new housing in and around Michigan City. Uh, so I think this will definitely uh, meet meet uh, the needs of the community. Because some of the younger families who have moved into the area have told me that the current stock of homes they see are very old. And uh, the new ones or the good ones that they see are close to the lake and they're very expensive and they can't afford them. You know? So I think there is a need. Pritz, Pritz Builders built townhouses at Riviera and Ohio Street. 
and they're all gone like that. Um, there's, there is a need, particularly this type of home, because some of us, as we get older and try to downsize, get into a smaller place with less maintenance, and that's what this offers. Uh, and so there is there is a market for this, and as I said, there are people already interested uh, in these units before they're even started. Thank you. Any questions? One quick question. When was the retention pond project completed? So that's been in place for a while? It's been in place as to present it for this uh, uh, rezoning because it has to be shown as part of the drainage plan for site plan okay. approval. Okay, thank you. So I'm not an engineer or an attorney, so maybe you could explain it. Looking at your drawing here, and I see where you've got your uh, drainage on, on the north side here. Yes. What's the key runoff from this development out of this wetland? Well, that's where the ditch is. And that wetland that's, you know, that's shown on there as a wetland, but it's really not. It's much smaller than what's shown there. And that wetland land has to be remediated uh, as part of the plan for the drainage of this. Uh, you know, when you deal with the Army Corps of Engineers, you trade land. Right. And that's what's going on Mr. with this. you want to answer and the te Mr. technical Stewart, question? Because I'm neither an engineer, although I'm an attorney. Well, let's let him yeah, In today's world where we used to do a curb and gutter and uh, just roll it down the curb and put it in retention ponds, we no longer do that. And this is a low impact development. So we're going to see what we usually see out in the county, more of a swale with a ribbon curb, just like we did for the new road coming out of the, uh, the Cleveland Avenue extension. So that water coming off this development and off these homes will go into a swale along the roads and work its filter its way through the grass before it ever gets to even the 50-foot buffer away from that wetland. We, we show more than the wetland and we show a 50-foot buffer to make sure we don't put anything in that wetland that is not already treated by some sort of filtration and natural vegetation. And 80% of the water, you see the two retention ponds in the north, will follow along that road and so it will will never even have the ability to get to this retention area because it'll work its way north and never go east in the first place. So we're trying to do every can thing we can the low uh, impact environmental that we use these days to keep all the salts and the fertilizers out of any e retention ponds or any wetland areas anymore because we know it just it feeds them the wrong sort of nutrients and it grows the wrong sort of things but also the sand and the silts will get trapped in the filtration along the yards instead of along the roads and in the wetlands. Well, that was my original concern was the chemicals, yes. you know, winter and summer, both chemicals, getting into Trail Creek, getting into Lake Michigan, and, you know, down the road 10 years from now, coming back going, why did somebody let this happen? You know. Yes. But when I, I did, uh, I, I got the letter here from Mr. Doyle, I called him. I said, I, I want to know what, what the concern is, what's going on. It's, he is an engineer, and he said, if it's not regulated, that the, uh, the additional runoff is going to be unacceptable. It's going to end up in that retention pond behind hammers. He said, already, when you have a lot of rain, you've got a lot of water sitting back there. And if, if this would add to it. So that's what I want to know, is how you keep that from happening. How do you keep that from ending up under, under 20 and in the back of hammers into that retention pond and flooding it worse than it already does? Yeah, these systems that are in place for this yard, even, even compared to a farm field, we're losing about 25 30 percent in runoff compared to the b2 uh, big box stores you'd have we're, we're easily reducing it by half but as if you see the ditch that was the uh, maintained and redug going north it's kind of a flat ditch so it it will reduce the flow and the amount of volume and per the calculations and the coverage but it will also reduce the rate at which it goes at those structures because the structure under hammers and under Johnson and back under 20 can only handle so much but in a short amount of time, we see that get over inundated on Highway 20, which is what Mr. Masters brought up, and I think you were involved in some of those discussions too, that we have tried over and over and endlessly with NDOT to at least allow us to keep the water from going to the north side to slow it down so those, re those culverts under Hammers and Johnson and 20 have a chance to let that water flow through because right now, everything is flowing right at those culverts 
at a rate that it cannot handle. Uh, NDOT did redesign the whole job. It got delayed. People probably wonder why it was delayed a year. They had to redesign the whole job. Uh, Mr. Masters and Mr. Pritz sat now in a meeting with a lot of individuals at NDOT and discussed with them the problems on 20 with this system. And they thought that it would be wise to do a hydrologic study. And I think it was even in a paper. They looked at potentially putting in a 30-acre pond six, seven feet deep over behind the Army uh, Reserve Center because there was so much water. Some of this water is coming all the way from Cleveland. And they didn't realize how much flows through this drainage way, which is Highway 20, that's impacting the north side of Trail Creek. And if we could slow it down, this development will reduce the capacity, but it will also slow it down to give it time for those structures to actually handle what's coming through there at the rate that which comes. It's, it's insane how much rate comes through that Highway 20. It must have been an old waterway. The hydraulic study showed it was an old waterway, an old wagon trail on 20. And as we built that road up, we've kind of reduced its capacity and it's beyond its ability. NDOT did redesign those pipes and they made them very large, which is probably not a good thing for the town of Trail Creek. But we also, I did send a, a letter to the town of Trail Creek board president, Jennifer, and showed her exactly what we're talking about. We're not talking about a complete redesign. We're talking about 150 feet of ditch on one spot and 300 feet of ditch of another. It's real simple, but we have been met stonewalled. We have been no way we're not going to do it. I don't understand it, but what w Mr. Pritz did to take this ditch along the east side is going to help them let that structure function during the time that it's really inundated and give it time to work its way so hammers won't see that big deluge of water. It's going to see a slower flow of water over a longer period of time. So you said that NDOT redesigned it, yes. but then now you're saying that they, they, they didn't? Or, or? They redesigned it to make their pipes bigger because they realized they were not big enough. Okay, so they did redesign. And they, so they're putting more water on Trail Creek, in my opinion, faster. And that means more water on hammers faster. And if we could keep it on the south side and keep it away and slow it down. The retention pond over there by the bank at Johnson and 20, if you guys remember, that was like mid-80s. And they had shut Highway 20 down. It had completely shut it down for weeks. I remember that. And they had to dig that retention pond to, to just slow the water down enough to let the infrastructure handle it. Then they put those big culverts in their hammers and Johnson back to 20. And that worked for a while. But then we have more runoff. We've had you know, the high school. We had the, uh, the training center up there. We've had lots of things. And it's going to keep getting developed. So Indiana Department of Transportation, where it's going to widen the road because it needs it for traffic and safety. And they, put, they thought they put big enough pipes. They did a hydraulic study, and they realized they weren't big enough. And we all know exactly what you're talking about. Nowhere in this design is Hammers Culvert, Johnson Culvert, or 20 Culvert to get bigger because we know they can only handle so much, and they are, they're large. You could walk through them, they're so big. They're the doubles, they're huge. But if we could, that, that took the water away from that retention pond that we built in the 80s, and now it kind of sits low, you never see it, it never really fills up anymore. It used to fill up right to the top and mm -hmm. stay there for months. Now it kind of stays low and there's lots of ducks and animals in the area. But if this water could go to that retention pond and sit there for even a half hour, an hour, and slow that capacity down to give Hammers and Johnson and 20 the ability to catch up, it would probably do wonders for the town of Trail Creek. And that's kind of what Mr. Pritz did. He said, okay, I'm going to take as much water if I can away from the town of Trail Creek and let it sit there and slowly wait until there's time for it can go through those culverts. You know, in a non-technical language, let me ask you this. <laughs> Are you saying that having this ditch uh, and then having this development will actually slow down the flow of water to 20? It will actually take some volume away and slow it down and give it time for the north side of 20 Trail Creek the time to catch up through hammers. So actually it'll help the flooding rather than aggravate oh, it. Oh yes. And I, it, that's it's, how it's, I interpreted what he said to Dr. Yeah, Cora. Yeah, because he's a surveyor, you're a lawyer, I'm a doctor, I'm just trying to try to put it in the non technical exactly what he's saying is right. it's directing water that, that otherwise would flow northward under that drain pipe right. at Pine Tree and get in the Trail Creek. Okay. It's diverting it to the east. Into, okay. the, into the retention pond. Actually, it'll, not ease, it'll mitigate the problem in, right. in a way. Okay, all right. It, and that has is, is already been done, or that's part of the plan? No, it's already done. It's already done. Yep. Right. 
Yep. It had to be done for the approval of the gotcha. drainage. Any other questions? No questions. Mr. President, I move to approve this uh, pr proposal. So I'll second it. Thank you. Uh, since this is an actionable item, uh, uh, I would like to open it for public comment if anybody else has any public comment on this. Thank you. Seeing none, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm, I'm going to abstain. Uh, Aye. So, two. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is item C, consider update from county attorney on the county's intervention in the NIPSCO rate case. Yes, Mr. thank you, Mr. President, yeah. members of the commission. Uh, the evidentiary hearing in this uh, in this case has been moved back uh, from its scheduled start yesterday to Tuesday, April 30th. Uh, several of the parties, including NIPSCO and the industrial group, consisting of the largest industrial customers as well as the Office of Utility Consumer Counselor, wanted a continuance as they believe some issues may get resolved in settlement discussions. None of the issues in Port Laporte County have been resolved, however, and we continue preparation for contested hearings now set to begin on April 30th. I wanted to give this commission and those watching at home some more detail on what is at stake in the case and why this county's intervention is so important. Laporte County's had a high degree of success in past cases dating back to the service center's case in 2002, where we were successful at blocking NIPSCO's arbitrary plan to close down the maintenance hub on State Road 2, which I'm proud to tell you is still functioning and fully staffed as we sit here today. What that case taught us is that many of the decisions made by NIPSCO management aren't made after a great deal of deliberation and careful study of what their peer utilities are doing. The decisions are often that particular year's whim and whimsy particularly since NIPSCO has seen seven different presidents of the utility since 2002, each of whom may have a pet project or a philosophy, so there's been little consistent planning for an energy portfolio or strategy from one year to the next. One of the issues we've continued to press the IURC on is the fact that ratepayers in Northwest Indiana pay some of the highest rates in the state. And you'll see in this PowerPoint uh, that NIPSCO's electric rates were second highest in the state 12 years ago in 2007. The next slide shows that continuing both in 2013 and even as late as this past July survey in 2018. Those rates are sky high even as customer satisfaction as measured by J.D. Power remains mired among the lowest one quarter of electric utilities in the country just as it did 20 years ago when NIPSCO pronounced itself shocked by the survey results. Rather than learn from the best in the country, they've continued on their merry way, continuing to pay huge salaries to their executives, all the while drawing more profit out of long-suffering ratepayers here in Northwest Indiana. The next slide gives you a good indication of the factors that go into the J.D. Power study and why J.D. Power is still viewed as the gold standard for benchmarking customer satisfaction, whether it's for utilities, cars, or refrigerators. As you can see, uh, there are a number of factors that go into that besides just uh, rates, reliability, customer service, citizenship, investment in the uh, community, that type of thing. As you can see on the next slide, NIPSCO's ranking with business customers in our region is still below the Midwest average for utilities. Same with its ranking for residential customers, which is on the next slide. We've had great success in raising this issue with the IURC in the past, and it can play a role in the level of any rate increase since customer satisfaction has been found by the utility regulators to be a legitimate factor to consider when authorizing what is known as return on equity awarded to any utility coming in front of it. We're also currently pressing forward and are awaiting a ruling from the IURC in what is known as a motion to compel NIPSCO to turn over certain documents to us. As you'll see uh, from the next slide, uh, and, and again, the documents that we're seeking are indicated on that summary uh, that is on that particular slide. As you'll see on the next slide and this slide, at the same time they're proposing decommissioning Michigan City Gen Station early, and it was proposed originally for 2035, it's now 2028. The question we're asking, did you study any alternative use of the facility, such as converting it to natural gas fired, wind, or solar? Ratepayers are being asked to continue to pay for the facility even after it's offline, and the question becomes whether that shouldn't be a burden of shareholders rather than ratepayers for the mistakes in planning of NIPSCO 
the management. NIPSCO received over a billion dollars from ratepayers this past decade to clean up its coal fleet and hung tough with coal long after other utilities were switching to renewables and now wants to shutter those plants. LaPorte County, as this commission has directed, is not opposed to halting use of the Michigan City Gen Station as a coal plant. But the question is, what's their plan to build replacement generation right in our county? That's a $100 million assessed plant with 150 good paying jobs. When it closes, that tax burden goes on the shoulders of other taxpayers in the county to pick up the slack. Why not look at replacing that generation by tearing down the cooling tower, the coal chutes, converting that facility to cleaner burning natural gas, wind or solar, and keep that assessed valuation right here. They are planning, according to documents they filed in the case, 35 years of groundwater monitoring once the coal plant is closed. That gives you a clue as to how contaminated the site is and unlikely of any other use in our lifetimes. Since the transmission towers are already there, the transmission lines, the question we've asked, what are the uses have even been studied, such as conversion of natural gas, wind, or solar. Now, one of the documents we're also seeking is a PowerPoint presentation that NIPSCO showed certain county officials in March of last year when they were seriously considering building a combined cycle gas turbine power generating station in our county. How serious were those discussions? This slide shows one page of what a NIPSCO prepared PowerPoint was that we retrieved from a file still in the Office of Economic Development that showed this plant that was seriously being considered last year would have met 176 million in new assessed valuation and 22 million in land. Those are tax dollars that would provide tax relief to residents and small businesses in our county. That is a $200 million plant that NIPSCO told certain officials a year ago would take 1.5 million man hours to build over three years. We know those negotiations were serious because they were asking certain county officials for tax incentives to build the plant in the spring of 2018. Now, can you all imagine the jobs and tax benefits that would result had that plant been built? And all of a sudden, NIPSCO decided at the end of last year to pull the plug on this project. Why? Again, ratepayers deserve to see the documents as NIPSCO lurches from one plant to the next, including now wanting to buy expensive purchase power off the grid <laughs> rather than build clean power generation right here in their backyard. The last slide shows various natural gas lines that run through LaPorte County that demonstrate why Kingsbury Industrial Park would be a perfect location for a new natural gas-fired electric gen station rather than somewhere outside of NIPSCO service territory. As you'll see on this particular slide, there is uh, there are natural gas lines that run adjacent to Kingsbury Industrial Park. Those are the issues that we're pressing in the rate case on behalf of LaPorte County, and we look forward to keeping you all and the public informed of progress as the case proceeds. Thank you for that update, uh, Mr. Friedman. Uh, any questions? Any questions? So, uh, Mr. President, I guess my only question and concern, uh, Shaw won't be surprised, that I um, really want to focus on clean energy. Um, wind and solar is where energy is going, and I think um, NITSCO should look at this county. It should look at replacing um, our own generation ability right here in LaPorte County. Uh, you know, the numbers that, that I've studied this from way back in the day, um, it hasn't changed, and, you know, uh, Mr. President Belinsky mentioned economic development. High rates do impact our ability to attract uh, good paying jobs to this county and so uh, while you're uh, lobbying on our behalf, um, I don't think the idea of um, having another cl even clean energy generation on the f lakefront of Lake, uh, in Michigan City is a good idea. Um, I have seen um, uh, recovery um, plans. I was working with Save the Dunes, and I've, I've seen presentations by environmental environmental biologists who show that exact footprint with uh, remediation done, and it, it is a long process, but it's not as scary as you um, may think. So I, I think that's the route that NIPSCO is a good citizen, a good corporate citizen. They should really pursue opening up that property after the appropriate cleanup is done. Um, but this county has a lot of really great, you mentioned Kingsbury being obviously front 
Wanted Center. It's a great location. But um, we also have other locations where wind, solar, and other uh, renewable energy, clean energy, um, could be pursued. And um, I think we're, we're on the right track. We're not only protesting the high rates that our, our citizens will, um, will incur if this uh, goes through un, unscathed, but we also want to make sure that they, uh, NIPSCO and, and their decision makers, their influencers, that they look at a location where they have had a home for many years. Uh, they, uh, you know, Mr. Mrzynski is a retiree. We have a lot of families who are um, NIPSCO families and are part of our community, and to have that pulled away and the impact left on the shoulders of the taxpayers just doesn't feel right, and uh, I ask them to reconsider. So thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just want to echo uh, 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 Commissioner uh, Bill Matias's comments that I, I think keeping the generating station here is is important, um, and then if we can if we can uh, clean the lakefront of that monstrosity and and uh, and have a nice um, nice uh, it's, we have a world class lakefront and if we can put it to use for uh, tourism and recreation and I think that would be fantastic and but I think we have a good options in the county like KIP because they were already looking at that as one of the options so if we can persuade them uh, to uh, to stay home where they have been all these years but at a different location with cleaner energy I think that will be great so thanks for all your efforts on this I appreciate it all right uh, next item on the agenda is new business and the new business is consider ordinance to vacate Lefebvre Farms LLC Anthony Novak Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Anthony Novak. I'm an attorney with Newby Lewis Kaminsky and Jones here in the port. Here on behalf of Lefebvre Farms LLC, here with me tonight is Jim Lefebvre, who is the sole member of that. Do you guys happen to have a copy of the petition or at least the um, Exhibit A, if I could just have you flip to that, that's all you'll really need to see. Um, Lefebvre Farms own those four lots um, that are all contiguous uh, except for that little 15-foot alleyway that runs east to west between the southern two lots. Um, that alleyway is platted. It's never been improved and there's currently no plans to improve it. Uh, Lefebvre Farms would like to have that vacated so that all of the lots can now be contiguous um, to themselves. Vacating that alleyway would not harm anyone's access. Access can still be had by 800 or the property or the, the uh, roadway you see just to the side being Lilac Lane. So we were previously in front of the plan commission. We re received a favorable recommendation and we would ask that you guys officially approve that vacation. Any uh, concerns from the legal? No, we've uh, we've reviewed the uh, proposed uh, ordinance and are comfortable recommending it to you. As a member of the plan commission, we did give it a favorable recommendation. I see no problem with it whatsoever, and I would make a motion that we go ahead and approve it. Support. Since it's an actionable item, I'll take public comment. If anybody has public comment on this item. Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next item is to consider proposed agreement between the Fair Board and Fairgrounds Management Events Corporation Nonprofit Board and the county regarding the fairgrounds. Good evening, Doug Beegee here, uh, acting as counsel for the Fairgrounds Management and Events Corporation. I thought I'd let the commission know as well as the public the configuration we've come up with uh, in this matter. Uh, as you may know, the county council pushed to create this Fairgrounds Management and Events Corporation in an effort to uh, create more interest out at the fairgrounds, do more infrastructure repair, and free some more money up for the fair board. So in the, in the past, the fair board has taken care of the maintenance of the grounds, etc., and they've had basically possession of the fairgrounds all year. Uh, we're converting this now. The Fairgrounds Management Events Corporation is going to attempt to get more events out at, at the fairgrounds. Ultimately, this year, this lease is for the 2019. Ultimately, the county will take over the maintenance of the fairgrounds. Also, this should free some fair funds, more funds up for the fair board to to improve and maybe construct more buildings out there. Now, it, this is important. We, the board that has been formed with the FMEC is consists of elected officials, appointments, 4-H people, fair board people, so it's a conglomeration of all that, as well as visitors, visitors Bureau. 
we've, we've constructed this lease so that the fair have, will have exclusive control of the fairgrounds the week of the fair, two weeks before the fair, and two weeks after the fair. In addition, we've, we've created blackout, calendar blackout dates where there are 4-H and Pioneer Village activities, and if those activities are in the pre-scheduled and if those activities are going on, then 4-H and the Fair Board will have priority over any events that, F that FMEC might, might schedule. So I know there are some people that were concerned about that. We've been very careful so that this configuration is, 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 is will hopefully uh, maybe create some more income out of the fairgrounds, but it will not affect 4-H or, or Pioneer Village operations in any way, shape, or form. So we're asking the board to approve this uh, so we can move forward with this process. Any questions? No questions, Mr. President, but um, I'm going to recommend that we um, take this under advisement rather than acting on it, and I'm on the on the uh, Fair Management Events uh, Corporation board as well, so I'm wearing two hats. Um, we, we would like our the county's attorney to examine. There's a, a few things that um, have been raised as concerns, one being insurance around the content of some of the buildings. Um, there's also an indemnification clause, number 13, um, about holding uh, the lessee harmless. So there's a few things I just I want to be sure that we're protecting the, the taxpayer as well as making sure that um, the, the fair board, the existing fair board, has what they need from us because um, we want to make sure that the fair, uh, the Agricultural Association, continues to um, feel very at home at, at the fair and make sure that we take care of our young people. So let's take it under advisement until our next meeting and make sure our attorney has um, has gone through it. And if they have any questions, Mr. Biji, hopefully um, Mr. Friedman can, and you can put your heads together. Thank you. Any comments? Uh, I would add that perhaps uh, since the county, the uh, commissioner's attorney, also the fair board attorney, Mr. Novak, make sure that they're all got it lawyered up here. Okay. All right. One of the concerns was about the exclusive use of the community building with the fair board because let's say the, the, the events corporation leases this uh, uh, the grounds to for a certain event and they may need uh, the community building so that's that's an issue that came up so while you're discussing this can you address all these issues please? sure yeah. okay thank you thank you, yeah. thank you. Um, Mr. President, on the prior motion we made on A, do we need to have a second reading on that? I believe that I believe that was your second that was reading. Second reading. Yes. He, he was the, he was here before that on, on, on the, the, on the uh, Lefebvre Farms. Oh, it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. It so, is. Oh, second on. I, I, so uh, Pritz has been approved. You're saying Lefebvre? That's uh, it was, okay. Uh, Pritz was twice. I know, but I don't remember. Thank you. The, Lef the, the farms at all. Okay. We just thank did that at the Blank Commission. So. Okay. Yeah, we could either do a second reading at the next meeting. Or we could. Or, uh, yeah, you could if you can waive uh, suspend the rules. Should we waive yeah, the rules and support. have a second right. reading tonight? I support that. All right. All in favor. Aye. Aye. All right. Thank no. you very much. And I'll entertain a motion to uh, to postpone consideration of item B, uh, so that that uh, the attorneys have a chance to address some of the concerns that have been raised and bring well, it back. Okay. We we voted to waive the rules. We need to vote to approve it on the second reading. I Correct. Appreciate. I'll do that. <laughs> All right. That there's a motion made. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Let, let's go back to item B and I'll entertain a motion to formally refer them back to the record. So moved, Mr. President. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Uh, and then the last time of the item on the agenda is consider a resolution regarding the payment of mileage allowance. Yes, uh, Mr. President, uh, members of the commission, you directed us to uh, prepare a resolution uh, that would uh, recommend, because it's the council that has a legal authority authority for the mileage allowance, but this recommends to them that they upgrade the uh, uh, and authorize the mileage allowance to be consistent with what is being authorized by the uh, IRS Internal Revenue Service. And, uh, and I believe, you know what, we're going to want, I think there was a revise that I sent through after comments from the auditors, so, uh, and you probably have that. I'm sure Diane's got it. So. Yeah, we have it. Motion to approve. Thank you. A, mo a motion has been made. S uh, support with with the comment that um, you know uh, the Internal Revenue Service every December releases a updated. Uh, sometimes it's consistently year to year. But sometimes it's lower tax uh, mileage rate and sometimes higher. And it came to our attention that uh, this year the rate happens to be higher. So once this is uh, um, resolved and adopted, uh, that the new rate will go into effect once the County Council approves it. But 
but um, we won't be going backwards, in other words. So if anyone has submitted their mileage previously, uh, once the action has been approved by the council, then the new mileage rate hopefully will be approved and move forward. So motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. I think that brings us to the end of the agenda. Commissioner Collins. Commissioner Collins. Yeah, do we have some high school students here? Yes. Yeah. From what school? Newport High School. Newport High School. And who's your teacher? Mrs. Kuda. Welcome. Hope you learn not to stay out of politics. <laughs> uh, the other comment I, made, I want to make is uh, with summer here, we've started already with the uh, paving project. We started on Joliet Road already. We got a lot of paving to do this year. Uh, we've got a, a, a lot of things going on with the Simcock Bridge. They're going to be doing some work on Seavers Road, which are going to have to reroute traffic. They have it rerouted around the bridge. We've got it rerouted around US 2 and 20. And once they start paving on I-94 and the toll road, that's going to put even more traffic on our roads that are already rerouted from these projects that we've got going on. Plus, we're going to have school out pretty soon. And our summer residents will be coming back. So, moral of the story is, pay attention on the road. Give these work crews a little little uh, respect here, because uh, they're out there doing what they do in the hot sun, and um, we want to get our roads paved, and we don't want any fatalities or incidences because of that. So, um, it's summer. Let's let's adapt. Out of that, uh, nothing. Um, Mr. President, I wanted to update the um, the commissioners and the public on our rural broadband initiative. Um, you know, I, I told you we had 22 people across the county volunteer to assist us with uh, the rural broad broadband task force, and I'm not kidding you. These folks are doers. Uh, already, we we've only had one meeting, um, which I updated you on, but already the group has met in subcommittees. Uh, there's a group that is meeting on um, currently current doing a current assessment of all of the technology providers across the county, uh, trying to figure out what services are being provided, what rate of speed is being provided, or what they say that they're providing, and um, and where the, there's pockets where there is no coverage. And then um, we're, we just today um, we released, um, it's not posted yet, but it's been approved, a survey of users, and this is where we really need citizens to get involved. So uh, tomorrow, Darlene, our IT director, will um, post the a consumer survey. This is for every citizen, every household in Laporte County can fill out the survey. And what it will do, it will, it will give us real live uh, deep dive into data. And so uh, what we're asking is every family that has a school child, every business, every healthcare organization, fill out a survey so that we have a really uh, deep um, deep, a lot of data to, to analyze, and that will give us an idea of what, we, what our problem is, because in order to solve the problem, we have to get the parameters uh, of the problem defined. So um, my request is that everyone who hears this message, or the media can help us, uh, go to the county's website tomorrow and uh, fill out a survey. We're also going to be um, sharing the survey through some of our uh, community stakeholders and partners like schools, and um, we, really, um, we really encourage people to help us solve this problem by defining it and giving us good information. So that's uh, one issue. The um, next issue, uh, as you probably remember, the county website has come up a few times. It came up last year in discussion and we had a, um, a uh, I believe it was a company from Oklahoma, uh, come to present um, an $80,000 solution to building a new county website. So uh, Darlene, our IT director, has done a great job over the years trying to keep our website updated, but it's from 2003. And you know technology, young people can probably smile. Anything from 2003 you know is beyond a dinosaur. It's about 800 years old in real life. So this, uh, anyone who goes to our website gets frustrated. It's hard to navigate. Um, it's hard to update. There's huge files of PDFs on there that shouldn't be there. It's just, it's really, it's met its, its useful, um, useful term, life term. So our suggestion and the work that we're beginning to do is to find a solution to that. The internet and websites um, are places for our customers who, who are taxpayers to get good service. And so our goal is to find a, a vendor and then build a super user group from amongst county employees who can make sure that our information is updated. So I'll, I'll share more information. We're just in the kind of um, investigatory stage right now. But as soon as we know more, we'll bring it back and begin to talk about um, what that looks like and, of course, how we pay for it. Uh, last issue I want to raise 
is actually really good news. Uh, you've heard Larry Butcher, our emergency management director, has come and presented on emergency management uh, functions of his department. Um, he serves in two offices. He has an office in LaPorte City, uh, right here in the county complex, and also an office in uh, City Hall in Michigan City. He uh, works really hard, as do a lot of uh, our partners, city government, uh, city police, city fire, uh, county sheriff's department, in finding money uh, to improve our services to our community. Uh, Larry led the charge in finding uh, funds. It was supported by the Michigan City Port Authority, uh, Arcelor Middle, a grant from Arcelor Middle, to um, place cameras on the lakefront in Michigan City um, to monitor activity, monitor dangers um, along the lakefront. Most of you are well aware, because we live here and we're here uh, 365 days of the year, we know that thing, bad things can often happen at the lakefront. During the winter, there's shelf ice and people who uh, think it's great fun to walk out on, um, on the ice. And then during the summer, uh, our, our um, rip current uh, claims lives every year. So um, we have now a camera system, a digital warning system. So we're using um, the heavy lift of technology to, um, to for public safety. And today it was tested. So today at 10:15, uh, um, Director Butcher was in his office in Michigan City, and he observed on the camera two adult males walking on the rocks um, uh, associated with the pier. And as he zoomed in on them, he noticed that they took out two sharpies black magic markers, and they began to write on the pillars along the pier. Um, he was able to capture those images and then report that to the Michigan City Police Department, and an arrest was made um, just minutes later. So this is a really good example. Before we get into our busy season, when we're talking about children on the waterfront, public safety, rip currents, and all those uh, really dangerous things, this is an example of um, good community service, people being innovative with technology, and having technology help with public safety. So I want to be sure to share that. Uh, we often, you know, we complain about the things that aren't working well. Let's celebrate the things that are working well. So this was a, a really great success story, and I congratulate uh, Director Butcher and his team, as well as all the other public safety and uh, 911 center for their, their work on, um, on our public safety improvements. Thank you, Commissioner uh, Bilson Matias. Uh, by the way, I want to thank you, Sheila, for your uh, leadership on technology issues, rural <laughs> broadband, as well as thank trying you. to improve our, our website because I think it's long overdue. Um, I Thanks. also want to congratulate Larry uh, Butcher on his work. And I worked with him when we had this polar vortex, and um, right. uh, it, it was a good team effort, and, he, and his team uh, from emergency management really worked hard on that. Um, I also want to thank both of you for uh, uh, the team effort we had at the State of the County event, uh, which we had at Purdue Northwest. And I want to thank uh, the Chambers of Michigan City, Laporte, and Westwood. I think it was a well-attended uh, event and well-organized, and uh, a lot of uh, members of the community were able to be updated on some of the things that are happening at the county level. And I also want to wish everybody a happy Easter. Uh, it's a holy week coming up. Up. And uh, last but not the least, um, uh, our colleague here, Commissioner Rosinski, is celebrating a milestone birthday this week. So happy birthday. Thank you. <laughs> With that, I'll entertain a motion for a general. All right.